Rub up your engines! Well, of course, everybody's talking about hydrogen fuel cell cars and trucks. Well, the big problem is most of the hydrogen created in the United States is gray. It's created from petrochemicals. After all, if you know anything about gasoline, it's just hydrogen and carbons in various formulations. So there's a lot of hydrogen in it. Presently, it's a very dirty process. So what's the point of making a clean car if it's fueled by a dirty process? Well, it turns out that scientists are now working on making shining light create hydrogen through organic chemistry. And there are some scientists that ACIC that have created little creatures that can make hydrogen. They're using non photosynthetic bacteria with self produced cadmium sulfide semiconductor nanoparticles. They're really efficient at capturing light and turning water to hydrogen. It's a bacterial energy production lab. Kind of interesting. So they're combining microorganisms with nanoparticles to create hydrogen. But the ones that they're working on, they say, are many times more efficient, especially when they use these nanoparticles. And the kicker is they're using solar energy directly and they don't have any kind of intermediate process using chemicals or whatever. Now, of course, if they are able to ramp this up to a large scale, they could have gigantic farms out in the country of bacteria and the nanoparticles creating hydrogen and collecting it and using it for hydrogen fuel cells. There's hydrogen all over the place. You know, it's in the water, it's in the petrochemicals. If you can get it out cleanly, hey, you can't argue that one. If you can use bacteria to do it and make it a large enough scale, we'll all be driving hydrogen fuel cell cars instead of battery cars that are very toxic to create. And then the electricity has got to come somewhere, which is usually burning petrochemicals. Of course, a lot of people, they always think, well, what's it going to be this or that or this? It could be all kinds of things. Some could be batteries. Some could be fuel cells. There can be a combination of stuff out there. It doesn't have to be one or the other. But of course, the one that's the most efficient and pollutes the least, that's the one that's going to be the winner. Here we go again with GM. They can't even make simple seat belts anymore. GM's large SUVs are being recalled for seatbelt defects. And this covers 2021 Cadillac Escalades, Escalade ESVs, Chevy Tahoe, Suburban, and GMC Yukon and Yukon XL. It's for the third row seats. I guess they didn't think much about the third row seats. <laughs> and it's those seat belts that aren't working right. Well, let's put it this way. At least they won't go flying through the windshield because they got another two rows to get through before they'd hit the windshield. <laughs> Turns out when they built them, they might have misrouted how they have them hooked up. They don't work right. Sheesh, you know, something as simple as a seat belt technology. That just shows GM's level of bad production. If you can't get a simple seat belt in the third row of these things built correct, imagine what the rest of the vehicle is like. That's why I tell people not to buy them. This may just be the tip of the iceberg, you know? They can't even build seat belts right. Pretty simple technology. A belt and a latch, you know? Come on. Let's get back to the drawing board, GM. JP Ratsa, Scotty, I got a 2010 Ford Explorer XLT rear wheel drive, 4 liter V6. I notice every time you put it in drive reverse, the lifters clack a little. It's almost inaudible in park. Should I worry about it? When lifters wear out in an engine, and you say you got 101,000 miles, when they're just starting and they're either, you often hear a little clacking. If it goes away, when it warms up and you speed up, no big deal. Now, the problem is, you have to change every single one of them if you wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to clack. That's a lot of money and a lot of work. As long as it runs okay, you're not tripping any codes, me, I'd live with it. I've had customers with stuff like that in Fords. They drive them 10 years and they're still making noise. And 10 years later, a little bit more noise, but they still run okay. Because if you really want to fix it right, you got to replace all. That's a lot of money. Ben 22683 says, I got a 1991 LTD Crown Vic that has 416,000 miles on it. The transmission's going out and rebuilds 1800. It doesn't burn much oil and is reliable. People said scrap it, but what should I do? All right. 1800 bucks isn't that much money for any kind of car that's going to last you for years. And those things can run a long time. Some of those things go three quarters of a million, or I read about one going a million miles. So what the heck, if the guy can guarantee that he rebuilds that correctly, and it's just a rear wheel drive transmission, which are much easier to rebuild than the complex front wheel drive ones, and it's an old 191. So it's not like it's a modern 10 speed automatic that's complex. It's a lot simpler. I'd say go ahead and rebuild it. if you like the car, it looks good and it runs, go. 
You try to buy a used car for $1,800, bucks, you are not going to get squat today in the market. Prices have gone sky high with coronavirus, and now people are getting stimulus checks, so they have money burning a hole, and they're buying used cars. So I would say get it fixed if you like the car. Otherwise, Adam Zatch just says, I got a 2002 Mercedes S320 CDI, 240,000 miles. It has entrance position, do not drive error. My battery went dead, and I replaced it, and then all this. All right. This is why you don't buy a Mercedes Benz. They are over engineered, technological, insane machines. You replace the battery, and all this occurred. That's because when you replace the battery on a Mercedes, a lot of stuff has to be reset. You're going to have to pay a mechanic, and in a case, it's a Mercedes. So he's got to have a star tester. Those star testers cost 15 to 20 grand, thousands of dollars a year to upgrade the software. So if somebody owns one, they're going to stick it to you to do that. That's what happens when you own a Mercedes. If you don't want to pay that kind of stuff, don't buy a Mercedes. Maybe you can find a Mercedes guy that'll reset it reasonably enough. But generally, when they get an old car like that with 240,000 miles, you bring it to them, they say, oh, well, it needs $5,000 worth of work, too. You know, we're not going to do it unless you do this work. It's a very much of a rat's nest. Once those start to break, you got to take it to the guys that have those fancy machines. Then they're going to stick it to you on just about every repair that you have. So, you know, if you want to get rid of that error, you're going to have to pay a guy with one of those machines. There's no way out of it. Maybe you can find somebody who isn't a crook where you live. Most places I've been, Mercedes Benz mechanic specialists that have that equipment, they're all crooks because they have hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in equipment and you're going to be paying for that. You don't like that? Don't buy a Mercedes. That's why I tell people not to buy them. So if you really want a Mercedes, lease the stupid thing. When it's off lease, give it back to them. Then you don't have to deal with repairs. Abraham says, my car pulls to the left after installing four some summer tires help. It didn't with the winter ones. Then I put summer tires on my Honda, original rims, and it pulls to the left, which it didn't do before. I put four like new condition Firestone all seasons on, and it pulls slightly to the left. You said like new condition. I'm assuming they're used tires. I would never put used tires on a car. You do not know the history. Why are they used? Why did someone take them off their car? Generally, they take them off their car because they had a problem. You didn't have that problem until you put these tires on. So there's something wrong with either the tires or the rims. Because you said they're on OEM rims. Now, I'm assuming your snow tires have their own rims. It could even be that the rims that they're on have a problem or bent or something. But more often, it's the tires. You say it pulls slightly to the left. Do this. Put the front tires on the back and the back tires on the front. If it goes away, live with it. If it still does, but then it's more the back pulling over, then you know the tires that were in the front that you put in the back have a problem. I go get another tire. Buying used tires is a mistake. It's too much of a gamble. Your life is on those tires. You want good, strong tires for braking, acceleration, not skidding in the rain. I would not buy used tires. Why are they used, you know? I mean, maybe you got lucky and it was some stupid person that a sleazy salesman sold them new tires when they didn't need them. But more often, it's those tires that had a problem. So, they'd, I give me new tires. And if some sleazy guy then sells those tires to somebody else, not such a smart thing to do. Horn Man 1972 says, my 2005 Mazda Miata, the manual transmission fill plug is stuck. I need leverage, but I can't because it's a short distance from the plug to the ground. Yes, it is a short distance from the plug to the ground. That's why you get jacks. It's a little car. Jack up that side of the car, put some big jack stands under it, then do it. And what you do is you get a giant extension bar to put on the socket, and it will break loose. There's nothing that beats leverage on a vehicle. Now, of course, I cheat all the time. I got big old air impact wrenches, and some of them are 1,500 reverse foot-pound of torque. But doesn't mean no good on that because you can't get it on a transmission. There's no room for the air impact wrench either. So in that case, I get a long extension bar. I got some that are four and a half feet long and a socket. And when you pull it, the longer the pull, it will pop and it'll come loose. You're going to have to jack it up in the air. You can't do it on the ground because, yeah, there's no clearance. So when you jack it up in the air, you got all that clearance. Do that. It'll come right off, believe me. Oh, one Crystal says, I'm looking at a 2009 Scion with 167,000 miles. The guy's asking 4,700. Is it worth it? Okay. Well, numero uno is asking way too much money for that mileage, and he just bought it to sell. That means that he probably bought that thing for two to three thousand dollars. If you can get him to come down a bunch, and a mechanic like myself says it's a good car, you might go ahead. But you want to check to see if that is the sign with the 2.4 liter engine that has oil burning problems. Ask a mechanic when he checks it out. If he says yes, that's that engine, and he look at a spark plug and say it's burning oil, walk away. Don't even think about buying. But the guy's asking way too much for that mileage since he just bought it and selling it. Why did the other person sell it? Is there a reason behind it? People that flip cars, they just flip cars. They know nothing about the history of cars.
cars. And you're getting a high mileage car with no guarantee. If a mechanic says it's good, yeah, try to get it for less. But if he says it's that oil burning engine, don't even think about buying. Don't throw your money away. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.